Last time we completed our review to the end of chapter 12, and um, we have we undertook to review the story of the Passover in Egypt. We had an opportunity to see what God's climactic plague or, or judgment was on Egypt. There's actually one more coming, but we generally view the um, plagues as a group of ten, starting with the water turned to blood and climaxing in the death of the firstborn, the tenth plague of Egypt. Um, that ignores a couple of early miracles that Moses did before Pharaoh, i.e. the serpents and so on. But um, we generally start with the water turned to blood, we count them as ten, and the tenth one being the one we had last time, the death of the firstborn. Uh, an, an incredibly, incredibly ominous circumstance that finally does, of course, even get to Pharaoh, and he uh, bids them leave. And that brings them to uh, the end of chapter 12 and allows us to jump in vigorously to chapter 13, verse 1. Now, you, you need to understand, the, try to put yourself in the position, if you can, of either the Israeli or the Egyptian, um, the firstborn of every family. That's hard. You know, we say that so glibly, but if you really think about it, that's staggering. Can you imagine the impact on our community in Orange County if the firstborn of every family died one night at the same time? We have no capacity to relate to something like that, uh, nor can we, conversely, try to visualize ourselves as members of that small minority that were spared by going through this ritual of putting the blood on the doorpost. But um, chapter 13, verse 1, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. You notice God is setting apart. Sanctify is a fancy word simply meaning to set apart, to reckon separate for some purpose. That's all sanctify means. We use that term rather loosely, probably never having thought of what it really means. It simply means to be set apart. God sets apart for himself the firstborn, not just of the people, but the firstborn of the beasts also. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. Now don't let that throw you. That's just an alternative word for Nizon. Either Abib or Nizon are both names of the first month of their ecclesiastical calendar. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Now here we see in Exodus that mentioned, which will be codified and elaborated on in the book of Leviticus, the second of the Mosaic feasts. First one was which? Passover. We just went through that, chapters 11 and 12 and so on. The second, and that starts the ecclesiastical year. On the 14th of Nizon, or Abib, if you will, uh, we have Passover. From the 15th for seven days, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Here referred to, and as I, we won't take the time tonight, but you can find it detailed in the book of Leviticus as it goes through all of the seven feasts. What does Passover refer to? The offering of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, uh, the, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What does the Feast of Unleavened Bread speak of? This is my body given to you, the communion. The communion, where we partake of unleavened bread. We will see next week another, perhaps more illuminating and elaborate example of the bread of life when we take up manna and learn many interesting things from this experience of, the, of, of Israel in the wilderness. But here we have introduced the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 7, the Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither sh shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. 
And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. What's he talking about? That it should be for a sign on thy hand and between thine eyes. The phylacteries, someone suggested, right? Where we take the word, bind it in a little leather thing on the hand. The Orthodox still do that today, right? Or in the eyes. How interesting it is, how interesting it is that this sign of adherence to the God of the universe by his word being on one's hand or on one's forehead is imitated, imitated by an administrator yet to surface on our horizon. A sign of a different kind in contrast to this one that will be administered as a um, uh, economic requirement and yet a testimony to loyalty to one that is going to usher in quite a conflict. And how interesting it is that both here and in this period that we expect on our horizon to be a period in which the world knowingly takes up arms against God. Pharaoh does that, we're going to see shortly, with a very peculiar result. And how parallel it is, perhaps, to what we're going to see in the Battle of Jerusalem. We often call it the Battle of Armageddon. I suppose Armageddon is to the Battle of Jerusalem what England was to the Battle of Normandy, a staging area. But that's where they gather at Armageddon, and it's knowingly going against God. And we see a very intriguing result detailed in Isaiah, Zechariah, perhaps most elaborately in, in the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19. Okay. Um, but verse 10. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb. In other words, they don't have to observe this now until they get into the promised land. He's going to give them a, a break, parenthesis. When they get to the promised land, they're going to have to observe a very peculiar thing here. They're going to have to set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb. Every firstling that cometh out of a beast shall, that which thou hast, the males shall belong to the Lord. The firstborn male of every lamb, every whatever, belong to the Lord. Verse 13, and the firstling of an ass Thou shalt redeem with the lamb, and if thou shalt, wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the womb, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. Very strange idea. The firstborn male of everything belonged to the Lord and was sacrificed to the Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. You mean that if I have a firstborn son, he's sacrificed? Yes, that's exactly right. With one small footnote, you had a chance to redeem it. And there's a procedure subsequently described where for silver you could redeem. You went to the temple, paid the silver to redeem the firstborn, so you didn't actually have to kill it. You, in effect, redeemed it with silver. What's the silver Levitically symbolic of? Blood. And the tabernacle rested upon hardware of silver. We're going to study that. And we're going to discover that the entire structure, sizing, materials, and details of the tabernacle speak of the completed work of Jesus Christ. But this redemption idea is uh, here explained. Now, one other uh, interesting study. We see the lamb is a type of whom? Jesus Christ. Do you know what the ass is a type of? 
Job chapter 11, verse 12, is one of many examples. I've just chosen one so we don't take up all our time tonight on a digression. But Job 11, 12 says, For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. You'll discover, if you go through the scripture, that the ass is a type of natural man. Ishmael, in contrast to Isaac, was born of the flesh. And Ishmael is described as a wild ass. You'll find that in Genesis, I believe, 16, 12, and Galatians 4, 30, and other places. You'll discover in Genesis 22, this famous incident where Abraham offers his son Isaac, that the ass was saddled, beast of burden. He was not among them going up the hill. And for he's always seen as one burdened. In Deuteronomy 22, 10, he's shut out of service. In, in, a, in a priestly sense. In 1 Samuel 9, 3, symbolic of that which was lost. And we could go on and on this way, and I'll leave it up to you. For those of you that are intrigued with such a study, you will find, interestingly enough, that the ass, in a typological or mystical sense, speaks of the natural man. I'm not sure that that particular insight will help you much in some of the dialogues you may engage in at work. Um, I don't recommend that you apply this scripture to, the uns to, uh, to your friend at work. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curiosity that you can keep to yourselves, but take, take interest in the fact that the Holy Spirit is, um, is, is intriguingly consistent at the way he indulges in his idioms from cover to cover. 66 books written by 40 penmen over thousands of years, and yet uh, admitting of a common idiom, a common structure, and a common theme, the theme of uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, we came down to about verse 16, I believe, right? Verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. God said, lest the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. In other words, they would have had a conflict and God wasn't, didn't feel they were ready for that yet. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up. Now, here's a controversial word. Uh, most scholars see this armed, but the same word can mean in columns of five. It's a technical word, and I don't want to get into the big controversies. It's not that important, I don't think. There's two renderings. They went up armed out of the land of Egypt. And indeed, they were laden, maybe not with arms, apparently explicitly, but with great spoil. Uh, the same Hebrew word or the root word, and the scholars differ on this, can also imply that they went up in a column of five abreast. You got 600,000 men plus the women and children, uh, say, just for our, just, a, just a windage kind of number. You're talking about a million people. Uh, uh, you can play around with that one a little bit to see how long the column of five were, if you want, and all that, but uh, I'm not sure it's constructed. Uh, verse 19, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with them, and when he had solemnly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and, and ye shall carry up my bones away from here with you. And indeed, when we get to Joshua chapter 24, they indeed take the body of Joseph and bury him at Shechem. Uh, we're going to see shortly that the Red Sea is typologically significant, and carrying the bones of Joseph is something you can revisit yourself after we've gone through the Red Sea and see what that may mean symbolically to you. Verse 20, And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Now, as a small point, Sukkoth means tent or booth. It implies a temporary residence. And they encamped at the edge of the wilderness. They're going to go through the you know, wilderness wanderings, and Sukkoth implies a temporal rest, uh, a pilgrimage kind of thing. Now we get to this fascinating verse. Verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them by the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. Now, at this point, we could embark on a very large, broad study of clouds and fire and so forth. We've seen, of course, in the Lamb a type of whom? Christ. We see the El Shaddai, God Almighty, doing all the other things. We generally associate that with God the Father. What's this cloud all about? 
Holy Spirit. How is he like the Holy Spirit? In many ways. He comes after the Lamb. Comes after the Lamb. And you go to Romans 5, one other places. He was a gift to them by the Father. They didn't do anything to earn him. He was given as a gift, unilaterally, by the Father. You can look at John 14, 16 to see the same thing said of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He was their guide throughout the experience of the wilderness. And we see, of course, from Romans 8, 14 and John 16, 13 and other passages where that's exactly what the Holy Spirit's uh, mission is. He was also their covering, their protection. And we see uh, that same thing in Psalm 105, 39, where the pillar is said to cover them there. And also in Ephesians 4, 30, we see that we are sealed unto the day of redemption by whom? Holy Spirit, interesting. We also know from Psalm 99, 7, in fact, we might do this to be sure that we're not getting off the track. Let's take a look at a few of these. Psalm 99, 7, it explains how God spoke to them. He spoke unto them, verse 7, in the cloudy pillar, they kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. He spoke to them from the pillar. Of course, what the psalmist is talking about is an experience we're going to see in Exodus 33, verse 9, and Numbers 12, 5. So we know that God spoke to Israel through the cloud. That's something we don't normally think of. We think of it as a guide or an indicator or a sign or something, but he actually spoke to them from the cloud, we have in those verses. And the Holy Spirit, of course, speaks to us in many ways, but perhaps to give you seven examples, I'll take Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters of seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, right? And we could go on. Uh, darkness, um, it provided darkness to the enemies, and uh, we uh, find that, of course, in Exodus 14. We're going to see that in Matthew chapter 11 and chapter 13. We find that the Holy Spirit not only illuminates us, but hides the truth from our enemies. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, and remember in Matthew 13 where Christ gives the parables, asking why do you give parables? That's so that they seeing will not see, and hearing they will not hear, remember? It was to obscure the truth from the ones that the Spirit had not selected. And uh, Matthew 11, 25, and Matthew 13, verses 11 through 17 are examples of, for those of you that would want to chase that. The Holy Spirit also rested in the tabernacle. We uh, will learn from um, Exodus chapter 40. But perhaps the most meaningful thing in Nehemiah 9, verse 19... And uh, John 14, 16, we, and also from this last thing here, it says, he never took the pillar away. He never took the, the pillar away. He took not the, verse 22 of this uh, chapter here. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire, of fire by night from before the people. What's another name for the pillar of fire? Shekinah glory. Right on. Verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before pi hei roth or something like that. <laughs> they don't laugh at me unless you've tried this, gang. <laughs> Between Migdal and the sea over against baal Zephon. Before it, shall, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Now, you've been with me long enough to know that I generally regard names as significant. And I, I have to tell you candidly, finding out that possible roots from which these words come is a non-trivial scholastic task, and not all scholars agree. Various Hebrew scholars have speculated what these words mean. One of the authorities has uh, analyzed the pi heheroth word, and it apparently means the place of liberty. The place of liberty. Migdal is regarded by another scholar to mean tower, okay, or fortress. Now, indeed, this was the place of liberty for Israel, as we will see shortly. It also certainly was the tower or fortress where God protected his own. Baal uh, uh, Zephon is regarded as the land of the north, which if you uh, note uh, Joshua 8, Isaiah 14, Jeremiah 1 and 4 and 6, and Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. The land of the north usually is suggestive of judgment, God's judgment being visited. And uh, uh, Joshua chapter 8, verses 11 and 13, Isaiah 14, 31, 
Jeremiah 1, 14, 4, 6, and 6, 1. I'm doing this for the tape, for those of you who want to chase it down. And Ezekiel 1, 4 can, uh, can find that the land of the north typically is suggestive of judgment. And certainly those three renderings of those three words are, are relevant to our story because that's exactly what happens. We uh, can still hear the words in our ear of Yul Brenner pointing out that there, that Israel's general uh, was a, that God, Israel's God was a poor general because he took them of a, to a place in which there was no retreat, and uh, that uh, is one view. I uh, I think this is often uh, more setting them up for an ambush or a bait for a trap, if you like. Certainly, uh, uh, the God of Israel uh, seemed to know what he was doing before we were we were all over. Verse three: And Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel. They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. And I will be honored over Pharaoh and over all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. <laughs> Sometimes the King James is so brief and to the point. Huh? And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Memories are short, aren't they? Right? <laughs> you know, I can think of a lot of water turned to blood and some lice and flies. And, and, you know, I would imagine the ceremonies of mourning for the dead in each household hadn't finished yet. And yet they wondered why they let them go. It's interesting how stubborn and self-willed we are. I can remember some friends of ours, uh, people who I don't really believe were saved, but happened to be watching the Ten Commandments when that was running around on television or whatever. And they were somewhat overwhelmed with the whole thing, and they were just saying how incredible this nation was to have seen all. They were really referring to some of the, the murmurings and things subsequent, you know, after they were in the wilderness and how they turned again, wanting to go back to Egypt. And how incredible it was that these people could be so stiff-necked that after seeing all this firsthand, that they would um, still not somehow really be with it. And yet, as we contemplate that, I wonder how much more we are judged. How much more do we know, have we seen in our own lives, in the thousands of years since this happened, all that God has done? And yet, where are we? Willful? rebellious, somehow in need of constant, continual bridling, reigning, adjusting. Um, interesting, interesting how, how patient God is to uh, deal with us at all. But anyway, here's Pharaoh and, and, and that bunch. Um, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with them, and he took 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, now it's not 600 chariots, but there's 600 of the best, and then all the other chariots, and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high, a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Paheharoth uh, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were in great fear. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. It's a wonder from both sides. You'd think Israel by this time would probably have figured that there's more action coming. I suppose it's hard to put ourselves in their shoes. They'd seen so much, we can, from our vantage point, be very impatient with them. Don't they realize if God has brought them this far that he's going to see it through? You know, isn't that smug and comfortable from our vantage point? <laughs> and yet at the same time, it, must, uh, it would terrify us, I think, to see that kind of an army, the most powerful army on the face of the earth, known to them, chasing them, and they're trapped, no retreat, no arms of consequence, and to find them bearing down on them, and um, feeling perhaps that their latter end would be worse than the former. What did they do? They seemed to do the right thing. Who'd they cry out to? Unto the Lord. How interesting. And they said unto Moses, Be, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did 
compelled thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. <laughs> Moses had a handful. Verse 13. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Interesting. Three things that we should do. These are the three things that we might indeed carry away with us tonight. Three things they were instructed to do. Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. The first step is not to fear. That sounds easy for us. We're not sitting there trapped on the cliff there between this army that's bearing down on them with the chariots and the horses and knowing that time is short. That's very flip for us to comment on it, but that must have been terrifying. What's their first step? Fear not. Why not? Lack of faith. God is going to deliver them or not. Do you have fear? You know, it's possible for you to have fear. It can be blasphemy. Do you trust God or not? It says, fear not. That's a commandment. Are you free of fear? If you have fear, there's something wrong. You're either not in the hands of Christ or you don't trust him. If you really trust him, you can't have fear. They're mutually exclusive. Someone has pointed out to me some time ago that fear is the opposite of love. Hate isn't. Fear, uh, fear is. Fear not. First commandment. Next thing is interesting. Stand still. I want you to notice the significant contribution they made to God's service here. Stand still. You want to know what you can contribute to God's plan? That gives you some insight. Stand still. <laughs> I'd be tempted to put a footnote. Keep out of the way. <laughs> I think many of us are so concerned for God that he, we feel he needs our help. And I suspect more often than that, he really wishes we'd stay out of the way. His job would be simpler if we just stayed out of the act. That's obviously, uh, there are many times, if we're lucky, God may give us an opportunity to participate. But for so this, these conceptions that somehow God needs our help are just fascinating. If you, if you want to really find out how much trouble God is in, listen to the radio late at night and hear these guys in Texas and Tennessee, wherever they come, Pasadena, wherever they come from, you know, you get, you quickly discover that unless you send that $10 bill in the immediate mail, God's work, God's kingdom is not going forward. It's really terrifying to realize how frail the kingdom of God is, that, it, that unless we send that $10 right away, God's purpose will not be accomplished. I think God gives us incredible opportunities to invest in his work, but the notion that he somehow needs us in that sense is tragic. Fear not, stand still. Now, of course, the thought here, we can build on this and, and talk about standing still, and in many ways that's very appropriate. But what I think Moses is saying to the people here is to just relax. God is going to take care of it for you. And in case you hadn't noticed, that's exactly what he did over 1,900 years ago. You could contribute nothing to what he did for you. If there was anything you could do, then Christ's prayer was not answered in Gethsemane. If there's anything you could do to be saved, to find your way into God's grace at the throne of grace, if there's anything you could do, Christ's prayer was not answered because in Gethsemane, he asked the Father three times if there's any other way than the cross, let's use it. Three times, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, asked the Father to let, be let off the hook if, it, if there was any other way for man to be saved. If there's any other path for you to reach the throne of God other than the blood of Christ, then God's sacrifice of his son was in vain because his son asked, yeah, if there be any other way, let's use it. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But three times he asked, and obviously the point was made that that was the plan that God had foreordained before the foundation of the world. So God did the whole thing for you and I. And to the extent that this experience in the book of Exodus is a model in some sense of that experience, 
It's interesting to notice the same thing. What did Israel contribute to their salvation? Nothing. They applied the blood and stood back. And God took care of the whole thing. And that's exactly the incredible news I've got for you tonight. Stand still. Now the last thing is, and see the salvation of the Lord. Now what I always thought that meant was, just stand back and watch. All these chariots are going to drown. It's going to be a mess. I don't think that's what he meant, by the way. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. We might take, start at verse 24 just to review this passage. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover. Oh, through faith he kept the Passover. What does that mean? That means he believed God and he trusted him for something he couldn't see. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. And on it goes. Okay, coming back to the passage before us, chapter 14, verse 13, it says, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. It could be that this might be taken in a sort of a primitive sense. Just watch and see physically what the Lord is going to do. I suspect that if we really meditate on the passage, you may come to the conclusion there's far more to it implied here that they are to see the salvation of the Lord in a broader sense. This isn't a tactical campaign. It's the final victory that we're talking about. Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today... <laughs> Ye shall see them again no more forever. <laughs> Heavy statement. That means they're not saved. It means far more than the fact that they were killed. Verse 14. Why? Because the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Oh, the incredible comfort of it and yet the frustration of it. The incredible comfort that you can't, you don't, you, you just hold your peace. The Lord's going to fight for you. The Lord's going to fight for you. Frustrating, though, how often we want to help. Draw a sword, get in there. We probably have a certain element in Peter, of Peter, in all of us, right? Draw the sword and cut off the ear of the high, whatever, you know, let's go. Just make more work for him. To unravel the mess we get into and then get around. <laughs> Verse 15. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. I've heard sermons preached from this verse. When you're in a lifeboat, you know, there's a time to pray and there's a time to bail water, right? And uh, the Lord says unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Move out. He says to Moses, But lift up thy rod, stretch out th thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians that they shall follow them. And I'll get me honor over Pharaoh and over all his hosts, over his chariots and over his horsemen. And the Egyptians sh shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor over Pharaoh, over his chariots and over his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them, the rear guard. That which was the lead was now the protector. Can you imagine being there? Can you imagine? I just, you know, it's even DeMille with all his uh, literalness and his imagination in do rendering that film probably had a, a tough time really capturing it. It's difficult to visualize being either on the Israeli or the Egyptian side witnessing that kind of an experience. Really as dramatic a thing as you could, you could ask for. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and a darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. That must have been freaky. And, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. 
and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, many people like to, taking this verse only, try to explain the crossing by natural causes. That gives, does violence to the rest of Scripture, because while it describes it as a wind, as God's instrument, we're going to see many places in the Scripture, both here and in the Psalms, where the image is clearly portrayed of the water heaped up high on both sides. So many people think that DeMille's rendering of that in the film was fanciful or excessively traditional. Not so. It was faithful to the Scripture in that regard, as nearly as the uh, effects of that time could try to render it. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and all his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels, that they drove them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Boy, I can imagine. Can you imagine being on the other side at the end of a day like that, or the second day actually, I guess, and... Um, I think it's absolutely staggering to try and visualize a group of a million people having experienced that sight firsthand, uh, not only to be delivered, but to see the entire army of the Egyptians destroyed. Staggering. It's interesting how many scholars have spent so much time trying to explain the crossing of the Red Sea by natural causes, which somehow misses the point, somehow misses the point. Vilikovsky in his book is perhaps one of the most popular, most interesting uh, renderings of that. Uh, Stanhauer, Patton, and Patch, the people, the NASA engineers that wrote the, sixth, the Long Day of Joshua and the other crises is an interesting book, another rendering of such similar things. Um, and, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And there's always some scholar that comes forth and tries to give God credit for even a greater miracle. What they try to propose is that this wind caused the Dead Sea to be very thin in a certain area, so that it was very shallow only three or four inches of water, and it would be no problem for Israel to cross the Dead Sea under those circumstances. And what they're really doing inadvertently is giving God for even a greater miracle because they're trying to convince us that God was able to drown the entire Egyptian army in three inches of water. I don't really think that's it at all. And uh, if I were to show you an article, if I brought with me tonight an article from the Biblical Archaeological Review or some similar such publication, that gave you conclusive evidential proof that there was, in fact, a separation of the Red Sea in Egypt at this time, approximately, that the Red Sea, and so forth and so forth. Would that alter your faith at all? I hope not. All it would tell you is, is that that was probably good science because that was, you know, we can corroborate that from the Scripture, not the other way around. We covered a lot of this in Genesis, but I thought it would be worth mentioning here. We accept this record not because of any archaeological digs or other evidences which we could bore you with all night of various things that people have found and have hypothesized and what have you. I'm reminded uh, just in fact, I think yesterday morning in the paper I saw some scientist that they discovered some uh, fragments of a rodent's tooth that was of a marsupial. A marsupial is a rodent that has a pouch. But I was fascinated how from a couple of scraps of teeth they could conclude that this was a thing with a pouch that was 65 million years ago, et cetera. It's amazing. There's a great efficiency in science. They come to incredibly large conclusions from very, very little data. That's really quite impressive. Um, 
Why do we accept this record? I, I have the same attitude to the, Red, to the Red Sea episode that I have to the virgin birth of Mary. We accept the virgin birth of the Red Sea or what have you because we know the scripture is true. How do we know the scripture is true? Because Jesus Christ authenticated it. What does that mean? Well, that depends. You have to know who Jesus Christ was. And when you study the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, discover that his every detail of his life was forecast hundreds of years before, and that even the very, very exact day that he was to, to be presented as king to Jerusalem, which he was, um, we discover from the testimony of Scripture that only one person in the universe had the capability to do that. And we discover that Jesus Christ just was indeed who he claimed to be. And when we understand who Jesus Christ is, and we discover that he authenticated this record, we accept the record because we accept Jesus Christ. It's not the other way around. You don't come to a faith in Jesus Christ because of the fact that you discover that the Israel you know, was drowned in the Red Sea. It's the other way around, at least for the, I mean, for the Christian. So you, you accept the book because you know the author. It's just like, as I often say in business, the same thing in business, not what you know, it's who you know. And if you know who Jesus Christ is, the rest of it all fits together. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, all the commentaries and scholars and archaeological discoveries in the world aren't going to avail you anything at all. So let's not get the cart before the horse, and let's thus not waste our time. Let's, let's spend our time finding out who Jesus Christ is rather than what some guy's theory is about whether it was the comet Venus or the comet uh, Mars that past the earth and caused these things. That's an interesting thing and may properly happen. It's worth reading, but it's not, and has nothing to do with what we're here to, to deal with tonight. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. Well, okay, we've talked about the Red Sea. Well, what is the Red Sea? It's interesting that the Red Sea represented the boundary of Satan's authority. The boundary of Satan's authority. And we discover that Israel is taken through the Red Sea in the same way that you are taken through death. And we symbolize that by baptism. It's interesting to see Israel carry with them the body of Joseph. Who is, jo who is Joseph a type of? Jesus Christ. Over a hundred ways, Joseph is described as a type. <laughs> so they're carrying the body, and we could, we could dig into the scripture where you are to carry the body of Christ with you in, in, in the sense of being crucified with him. Galatians 2.20, you were crucified with Christ. And Ephesians 2.5 and 6 and on, on and on. You might turn to Isaiah 53.2. It's always nice to get good New Testament doc doctrine from, uh, you know, a New Testament book like Isaiah. Isaiah was written by Handel back some years ago. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 43. Take the first couple of verses. Isaiah chapter 43, But now thus saith the Lord who created thee, O Jacob, who formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have what? Redeemed. Redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. You going to mess around with Israel? Watch out. Watch out. All the nations of the world since the beginning of time have been judged by the way they deal with Israel. That, does that mean Israel's right? Does that mean Israel is right in the heavens? No. But I sure wouldn't mess around. I sure would not want to be adverse to Israel. Every great empire in the history of man has prospered when it treated Israel well and was crushed when it went against Israel. Thou art mine, says God. Verse 2, that's the one I'm really after. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Ooh, really? Water first, fire next. Isn't that what Peter talks about? Interesting, isn't it? And of course, we have here a reference to the uh, thing. Just to make sure you understand that we have verse 3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. What? Thy Savior. How interesting. That's in the Old Testament, huh? Interesting. Anyway, back to Exodus. Uh, if you haven't been through the Isaiah tapes, I, I, I recommend you do. Um, now, one other thought as we talk about uh, the, the, the Red Sea, the crossing the Red Sea is typed by many to be baptism, passing through death unto life. They're going to travel how long? We're going to see they're going to travel three days. What's three days? The interval between death and resurrection. Um, it's also interesting that we have the Red Sea, okay? You might turn to Psalm 65.7. And this is one of many references, but you give the flavor of what I'm talking about. Who stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. 
We could go on and look at uh, Isaiah 55, I think it is, and then we can look at Daniel 7, 2, and Revelation 17, 15. What is the troubled sea always? The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, right? You know what Isaiah says? Daniel 7, 2, the waters. So the, the, he saw the beasts rising up out of the sea, right? They were Gentile kingdoms, right? Revelation 17, 15, what is the sea? Revelation 17, 15, he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest were what? Where the harlot sitteth are, peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What are the waters? The sea. The Gentile world in trouble and so forth. And this whole business of the sea is a, a fairly consistent idiom. Uh, the, the fact that the Holy Spirit tends to use these idioms consistently. If you don't have a lot of knowledge, you always give it a big name. It's the principle of expositional constancy, <laughs> which means he uses the same idioms all the way through. So it's interesting to see Israel delivered through the waters. And to the extent that the Red Sea speaks of waters in the sense that other prophetic apocalyptic passages do, I leave to you to judge for yourself. It may or it may not. You can sort of deal with that as you will. Chapter 15. Chapter 15 is an interesting, interesting uh, passage. We're going to have a song here. This is interesting because it's the first song in Scripture. It's also, in that sense, the first poem. The song of redemption. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. Now, by the way, before I point out, uh, before we go on, don't take singing casually. Do you realize that nowhere in the scripture do angels sing? Didn't know that, did you? Doesn't that destroy half of the Hallmark cards? Huh? <laughs> we know that angels shout from Job 38, 7. We know that angels praise from Luke chapter 2. And we know that angels can praise God saying in Revelation 5, 11 and 12. But we don't ever really see in the scripture angels singing. Do you know why? Do you know that there's only one group that we see singing in the scripture? Do you know who that is? The redeemed. Somebody said the church. Not fair. The redeemed are the only ones that we see. Only the redeemed sing. I think that's interesting. It's particularly interesting if you go through the scripture from Genesis through 65 books up to Jude and have noticed that. Then when you get to the book of Revelation and you see certain groups singing, it helps you identify who they are. Only the redeemed are singing. Moses and the children of Israel sang this song unto the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the sea. The depths have co covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency hast thou overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Same idiom that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3, for those of you who want to chase that down, in a very relevant passage. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, and the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, and the earth swallowed them. Verse 13, the key verse, the entire book of Exodus, the key, the verse that summarizes the message of the entire book of the book of Exodus. 
chapter 15, verse 13, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Praise God. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. We are not talking about people who lived thousands of years ago that are of academic interest to us. We are talking about what God has done for you and I. And that here is simply a foreshadowing, a model of a reality that you and I can partake of. He has, in his mercy, led us forth whom he has redeemed, and he guides us with his strength unto his holy habitation. That's what it's all about. Here modeled in the book of Exodus, but amplified in the book of Ruth and Joshua and so forth, and climaxed in the detailed scenario in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19. That's what it's all about. I often regard most of the rest of the scripture as simply supporting documentation to explain what's going on in the book of Revelation. A very reasonable approach to studying the scripture is to study the book of Revelation and to study the to simply track from each verse and word into the rest of the scripture to see what it means. If you do that, you'll go through the entire Bible and you'll discover that everything here from Genesis 1-1 onwards is there as support to lay the foundation for the book of Revelation. That's why it's the one book, the only book, that claims such a peculiar, a unique blessing on the reader. But anyway, this verse 13 is a summary of Exodus, a summary of Revelation, in a sense, and it's a summary of what God has done for you. Far broader, more penetrating message than the creation itself. Now, incidentally, uh, the concept of salvation, we've sort of stumbled into that. You'll discover, interestingly enough, that that does not appear in the book of Genesis. It can only occur after the blood. In chapter 14, it was seen. In chapter 15, it has become. The Lord has become my salvation. We see, indeed, the Lord becoming our habitation, just as he does in Revelation chapter 21. We see that uh, the Lord is a man of war, verse 3. The Lord is his name, just as he is in Revelation 18 and 19. In fact, he gets praised because he is a man of war. Because he's a man of war, not directly, because he hates sin. We see praises here to that effect, and the praises we see in Revelation will not be understood until you realize what they're praising him for is the fact that he has taken his wrath out on those that war against him. Very strange book. Uh, you know, it's funny how we sort of have a Sunday, some of us may be victims of a certain Sunday school mentality which says, gee, there's the God of the Old Testament who's tough and rough and severe in contrast to the God of the New Testament, which is peace and love and isn't everything nice. And we, when we mature biblically, we understand it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And the God that hates sin and is so vigorously a, a champion of his people in the Old Testament is no less a vigorous champion of ourselves in the book of Revelation. So that's worthy of a lot of uh, thought and meditation to recognize that God does not change. And uh, what well, we're simply seeing him uh, in different ways dealing with things that we can perhaps understand best by what he's doing. And if he's using the heavy howitzers, you know he's against a heavy enemy. And um, so forth. All right. Yeah, okay. Verse 14. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia, and the chiefs of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till thy people pass over whom thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. 
And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The song of the redeemed. Now, by the way, this you saw in here reference to the fact that this event will cause fear throughout the world. The word will get around what God did against Egypt, and indeed it did. We'll discover in chapter 18 in Exodus, as we get there, is that Jethro, Moses' father, makes reference to this. It terrified him to learn of all of this. When Joshua goes to Jericho, sends the spies in, remember? Remember Rahab receiving? Okay. Rahab uh, has heard of the exploits. She's ready, right? And so she not only gives them uh, assistance, but she joins Israel and becomes Mary's uh, Solomon, and they two of them have a son by the name of Boaz, who is to take a Gentile bride by the name of Ruth and thus be, become a model of the kinsman redeemer. We have uh, the Gideonites in Joshua 9, similar kind of thing. They've heard of the exploits of God against the Egyptians here, and the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, same thing. So those are all examples, uh, or if you will, fulfillments of what in effect is a prophecy here in uh, chapter 15. Okay, now that brings us to verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. That's interesting. You turn to Psalm 63.1. These are the few verses we don't sing. We usually sing verses 3 and 4, right? Verse 63.1 says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth after or for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Interesting, right? What's the answer to that? Jesus Christ gives us the answer in John 7. Those of you that were in the John study will, of course, immediately remember John 7, 37. For those of us that memories are not quite that good, we'll take a peek ourselves. And um, we find that uh, uh, John chapter 7, verse 37, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Who is that living water? Jesus Christ. We're gonna, we can see that all the way through here. The living water comes from Jesus Christ. Where's the living water going to come from in this story? Iraq. Okay. Well, that's actually getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we're, we're, we got the right idea. Okay. Verse 23. And they came to Marah. Who led them there? They stumbled in there by accident? Were they off the plan? Were they lost? They didn't, they, they didn't follow the Lord's map? Or did he bring them there? Why did he bring them there? The water, uh, they had no water, right? They came to Mara, and they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Mara. What does the word Mara mean? Those of you that are students of the book of Ruth, remember what Naomi said? Call me not Naomi, which means pleasant, right? Call me Mara, right? Bitter. Same root from which we get the word Mary. Mara, bitter. Why did God bring them there if the water was, waters were bitter? I mean, isn't he taking care of his own? I mean, hasn't he left, you know, got them out of Egypt and done all these wonderful things to, what now, to get, to, so they're going to all get thirsty and die? Why did he do that? They came to Marah, where they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Marah. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Strange, isn't it? Here they are. They've been led out of Egypt with all these plagues. They've absolutely left in the shambles, the largest kingdom you know, on the earth. They have been supernaturally guided and then through, through the Red Sea, and then the sea was closed up to totally wipe out the number one military force on the planet Earth at that time. And uh, now they're here, and they're led by this cloud, and they can't drink the water, and they're murmuring. Interesting. You might turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Just in the event that you've been wondering why this pillar of cloud has led you to where you are tonight. I'm making a lot of glib assumptions there. You might remind yourself of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. 
in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being what? Predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God has you right where he wants you. Right where he wants you. I remember once in a very interesting situation where there's a great tragedy in a family. And there was a lot of grief. And a friend of mine who led the prayer led a strange prayer. I've never forgotten it. Instead of praying for solace to the widow and for comfort to the family that they might be comforted in their time of stress, he prayed, Father, we would that the lessons not be wasted. I've never forgotten that. That the lessons not be wasted. And that's the, probably the story here of Mara, the waters that were bitter. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Verse 25, And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he tested them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Moses did what they should have done. Moses cried unto the Lord. They murmured, he cried unto the Lord. He was their advocate. And I praise God that we have an advocate. I praise God that when I don't pray as I ought, he prays for me. He cried to the Lord. And what does the Lord give him? A tree. Oh, boy. Here we can, here we can, we can really start going here. Um, we can turn to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Notice the law being kept is the key idea here, right? Did you notice that earlier? That's what, I don't know if you noticed, that was the first place statute showed up in the Old Testament. Made the statute there, right, when he gave him the tree? Kind of an interesting link there, isn't it? The tree and the statute? Notice here. <laughs> His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And what? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in its season, and his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not sober, like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Hey, interesting. We have the concept of the statutes tied to the concept of the tree, and the tree healing the water. Okay, that sounds pretty good. We go to Song of Solomon and see a similar idea. But let's skip on, in the interest of time, to 1 Peter and chapter 2. Let's find out more about these trees. How do these trees heal us? How can you be healed by a tree? Moses has, the, God heals the waters in Mar, at Marah with a tree. We have that same concept exhibited several places in the Psalms, the most conspicuous from being Psalm 1. How do, does a tree heal? 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 24, tells us how a tree can heal. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Concept of the tree, concept of healing, but don't miss the other link there. Should live unto righteousness. Live unto righteousness. Okay. How interesting. There were no statutes in Egypt. The statutes didn't apply until they were delivered. They weren't delivered from Egypt because they kept statutes. There were no statutes in Egypt. They, were, they applied the blood. They were delivered from Egypt. They passed through the Red Sea. Now he gives them a statute in Exodus chapter 15. I think that's kind of interesting. We can't leave this idea with uh, healing and trees and all that, since we're obviously all prophecy buffs. Our minds flashed immediately to Revelation 22, right? <laughs> Revelation chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street in, uh, of it, 
And on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bore 12 kinds of fruits and yielded her fruit in every month. And the leaves of the tree were the, for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. And on it goes. Interesting. The concept of healing, the concept of a tree, tied to the concept of the curse. Keeping the statutes, the law, all the way through to the end. Go to Philippians 3.10 if we had time, but we'll move on right now. Verse 27. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water, threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. How interesting that is. How interesting that is. We have no reason to understand why does the Holy Spirit here tell us there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. 12 brothers and 70 in Egypt, that's one idea. The other suggestion I commend to you is Luke chapter 9, verse 1, all the way through chapter 10, verse 1. And he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out, right? On it goes, right? And we have that whole scenario there, right? We get to chapter 10, Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face every city and place where he himself would come. How interesting. How interesting. Is there some big theological point here? No, no. No, but I do see a smile on the Holy Spirit's face as he sort of puts a little thing. <laughs> well, we do have a little time, but I, I, won't, uh, I, want, I, I want chapter 16 to be a very special chapter. And uh, I would like you to study chapter 16 carefully. We will obviously cover, we'll probably cover 16 and 17, and they're fun, fun passages because there we could spend, oh, there's just a lot coming. There's just a lot coming. But what you might do when you study in chapter 16 and study manna, take a sheet of paper and um, try to see how many ways that that manna refers to the word. And if you can find seven ways that the manna is like the word, you're halfway there. In other words, there's 14 ways. If you want to, I'd like you to find how many ways does manna relate in some way to Jesus Christ. If you find seven things, you're a third of the way through. You'll discover manna has some strange properties. It's not as obvious until you be careful. You can't go and get some for a friend. Everyone has to get their own. <laughs> I can't get the manna for my son or my father or my cousin. They have to get their own. I commend to you both uh, the manna study for next time and the water from the rock. There's going to be some interesting little surprises there too. But um, as far as the, the, period, the area is concerned, remember chapter 15 verse 13 is a key to the whole book. But in terms of appropriating this whole passage to yourself, I commend to think of those three things that Moses admonished Israel as she stood at the brink of the Red Sea crossing. Fear not. Fear not. As I'm fond of saying, if I could tell you with great authority, let's just pretend that I could with real authority tell you that at 1.30 this evening, Jesus Christ is returning to planet Earth to get his own. Does that scare you? If that excites you, terrific. But if that causes a trickle of fear to pass through your being, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, you're not ready yet. He wants you free of fear. If we talk about Armageddon, if we talk about neutron bombs, if we talk about Zechariah 14 or 12 or what have you, does that scare you? He says, fear not. Now, if you're an Egyptian heading for the Red Sea in a chariot, <laughs> that's a different ballgame, right? 
<laughs> he says, stand still. Stand still. And he says, see the salvation of the Lord. I'll leave, with you the night, leave that with you tonight. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you for this evening. We thank you, Father, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We thank you, Father, that you have ordained our redemption before the foundation of the world. We thank you, Father, that you have gone so incredibly far as to provide for our inheritance as nothing less than simply predestination from the counsels of your own will, your sovereignty. Father, we're both thrilled and humbled by our position which you have made available in Jesus Christ. We ask you, Father, to increase in our hearts an appetite for your word. We would ask you, Father, to just help us to partake, to be nourished, and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We would ask you, Father, too, that if there be any here tonight that are not resting in the confidence of his lordship, that you would give that person no peace until he rests in the bosom of your son, in the confidence that by his authority and by his completed work, we have an inheritance with you. As we go forth, Father, we just pray that you would be with each and every one of us, that you would help us appropriate these ideas, these thoughts, these messages from you to our week forthcoming, and that you would just help us perceive your handiwork in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.